So allow me just quickly to introduce our speaker for this year's annual uh, lecture. Uh, Matthew Goodwin is an academic, author, and speaker, best known for his work on political volatility, for his work on risk, for his work on populism, British politics, Europe elections, and Brexit. You've probably got the idea of why we asked him to come and give a talk uh, today. He's currently Professor of Politics and International Relations at the University of Kent and Senior Visiting Fellow at the Royal Institute of International Affairs at Chatham House. Still in his mid-30s, he's one of the most sought-after academics in his field. He frequently appears in broadcast and print media and has engaged with more than 200 organizations from the European Parliament and the US State Department to the Prime Minister's Office and the Deutsche Bank. He's the author of six books, including National Populism, which was listed among the Financial Times Politics books of 2018. But Matthew, there has been the occasional setback. You know where I'm going to go with this, don't you? Uh, Matthew predicted, as many of you will know if you follow this on YouTube, that Labour would not reach 38% of the vote in the 2017 general election, and that if it did reach 38%, he would eat his book. <laughs> and he did eat his book. Google it. Matthew Goodwin eats his book on Sky TV, um, page by page. I don't know how far you got, but you two certainly... Pages. Two pages. <laughs> two pages. Well, we're delighted to see you survived it. Uh, Matthew is an avid social media user. He has more than 50,000 Twitter followers. And according to our local research, there are at least five of you in this room at this moment online uh, tweeting. So please carry on during the course of his lecture. Matthew, thank you so much for coming to talk to us today about Brexit and populism. Great. Well, thank you for the um, very uh, warm introduction. Um, I thought I'd start by uh, just telling you something that I read on Twitter on the way here, which I think summarizes uh, where we are with Brexit. Michael Gove uh, was on the radio this morning and compared a day's delay to Brexit to having a kitchen installed and then being forced to wait an extra 24 hours for the hob. Would you rip the whole thing out, he asked, or just wait one day for your perfect kitchen? At which point a caller said, I would rip it out. <laughs> So what I want to do over the next uh, 45, 50 minutes is really um, take this Brexit moment head on and try and explain where I think we are, where I think we're going, um, and hopefully summarize a lot of other um, work in social science, um, which, which has also shed a lot of light on our Brexit moment. Um, I want to start with one of the old unwritten laws about British politics, which is that we don't do populism that if you go back to the literature in the 90s, Britain was alongside Germany, uh, Spain, and Sweden as being noted for not having a successful populist movement. I think that law, in various ways that I'll talk about today, is being uh, gradually overturned. I think it's also true that one of the uh, peculiarities of our Brexit moment is that it's making our politics more European, uh, in the sense that Brexit is exacerbating the fragmentation of the party system, a rising volatility, polarization, and a resurgent populism, uh, which is afflicting many other European democracies. It is an irony of sorts that our politics today looks more European uh, than it did before the referendum. Brexit did not cause all of this. Some of the deeper currents, as I'll show you, have been building for a long time. But we now have a lot of evidence, I would suggest, uh, that shows that Brexit is exacerbating uh, a lot of these deeper social, uh, economic, and political divides. And it's likely, I think, that national populism, either as a political movement or as a set of ideas, is going to remain uh, entrenched on the political landscape uh, for the foreseeable uh, future. Labour and the Conservatives are rapidly approaching Judgment Day. Uh, there are two tribes essentially within the conservative camp that hold irreconcilable differences on a range of issues, but Brexit being the most important. And conversely, on the opposite side within Labour, there are two tribes that similarly hold irreconcilable 
uh, value differences on these new identity and cultural issues. Uh, there is going to be no easy way out for Labour or the Conservative Party, uh, given the current uh, configuration of the party system uh, and the salience of Brexit. So I want to tell a story really in four parts. I want to start with some of the deeper currents that are swirling beneath what was once known as a stable and quintessential two-party system. I want to summarize the social science evidence on why people voted leave uh, in 2016. I then want to look at how the issue of Brexit impacted upon the two main parties in 2017 at the general election, and then uh, present some analysis that uh, I've just finished on the 2019 European Parliament elections, looking at how what happened only a few weeks ago is really compounding um, a lot of these uh, tensions. And then we can go into some discussions uh, and maybe a debate. So if we start with some of the deeper uh, currents that are sweeping through. This was the Festival of Britain in 1951. Um, people at that point in time obviously were living in a very different party system. Uh, it was uh, a party system that was dominated by two very strong parties with coherent, largely coherent electorates, um, where volatility was pretty low, um, where there wasn't much uh, uh, populism uh, to be seen. Um, but as we now know, uh, this uh, was a very long time uh, ago. If you look at the party system from 1950, 51 to where we are today, and the combined share of the vote going to the two main parties, either at general elections in blue or the European Parliament elections uh, in red, we've seen uh, considerable change uh, to the point that only a few weeks ago, the two main parties combined plummeted to 23% of the vote, which is the lowest combined share since the emergence of Labour and Conservatives as the chief uh, representatives of the two-party system. We also know that party identification in Britain has also fallen off a cliff, that if you look at the percentage of voters in British politics today who we would characterize as being very strong identifiers, uh, that, that percentage has gone from 45% during the era of Harold Wilson in 1964 to about 15% when David Cameron won his surprise majority government in 2015. This process of de-alignment uh, is by no means unique to our politics, but it is inevitably creating a more fluid and volatile party system that's much more open to new party challenges. And all of this, of course, predated what happened in 2016. I think as well this goes, in, uh, this goes hand in hand with the weakening relationship between social class and party voting, as David Sanders and a few others uh, have shown, and I've included links in the slide, so when they go around you can go straight through to the studies and have a look. Um, but that weakening relationship between class and parties uh, is absolutely central to understanding this uh, breakdown of two-party dominance. It's also uh, true that as a consequence of all of that, we've now got much higher rates of volatility. In fact, if you look at the British election study data, which looks at the combined level of switching from Labour to the Conservatives or from the Conservatives to Labour from one election to the next, then 2017 was the most uh, volatile uh, general election uh, really uh, since uh, we started collecting uh, data uh, on this. If you look at this from a slightly different angle and just look at overall vote switching, not Labour to Conservative and Conservative to Labour, but all switching between all parties, then actually the 2015 and the 2017 general elections were the two most volatile uh, on record, as you had lots of uh, um, Lib Dems and Greens, for example, going to uh, Labour, lots of UKIP voters going to Conservatives, some Conservative Remainers going to Labour, some Labour Leavers going to the Conservatives. So volatility uh, is very much uh, here. And that's reflected too in the rising uh, of the effective number of parties, which has been gradually increasing too, before we even got to that 2016 vote uh, for Brexit. In fact, the 2015 general election was the most fragmented 
uh, general election uh, in history. Uh, in terms of the effective number of parties winning a larger number of votes uh, and an increasing disconnect between uh, English, Welsh uh, and Scottish uh, systems. So it, it's very tempting to say Brexit's caused a lot of the problems that we see. I think if you just take a step back and look at these longer term trends and currents, the two party system has obviously been under considerable strain with multi-party politics trying to burst through uh, for a long period of time. And this is partly, of course, a story about how British society has changed as well. And I don't need to, to tell really many of you this at all, as you know this story. Um, but in, in two important ways, I think what we're seeing today is a reflection of social change. The, the overall share of uh, the population that's working class, that's a member of a trade union, um, that's a, a council tenant that has no, uh, that have no educational qualifications. That these, all of these key groups, which in other European democracies have been pretty central to populist electorates, over time have gradually been declining as an overall share uh, of the population, which of course is mirrored in the rise of the new sort of professional middle class, university degree holders, uh, homeowners. And that the broad social and economic transformation of Britain over the last 50 years you know, is really a critical backdrop to understanding what happened in 2016 and also what's happening now. That we do have a number of social groups that feel that they've not been given considerable, oh, sorry, um, uh, comparable levels of um, uh, you know, respect, um, recognition, dignity, um, lots of words we don't really hear in politics too much these days. And that in very broad terms, we've, we've transitioned to a society that's given a lot more uh, time to professional middle class degree holders. And I think that was absolutely critical to making sense of this shock to the party system that if you track support for leaving the European Union across these different social groups. The first thing to say is, as Britain approached the referendum, Euroscepticism overall was increasing. Support for leaving the EU among all groups was on the rise, which again makes us wonder why we were so, so surprised by the result. Um, but it was really among voters who had not benefited from the educational system, um, among working class voters, that you really saw this very sharp increase in Euroscepticism uh, between sort of 2005 uh, and going into that referendum campaign um, period. Uh, and that was really absolutely critical, I think, to a couple of things. One is that the Eurosceptic tradition, particularly in England, not so much Britain, also partly in Wales, I think remained very strong. Uh, it was underestimated by a lot of people, that if you look at the long-term data, um, which I think a few people during the referendum campaign took their eyes off. I just finished in the US, for example, I just finished reading Hillary Clinton's book, What Happened? And I got to the end and I realized she still doesn't know what happened. <laughs> in the sense that there wasn't much in the way of a discussion of the long-term trends. Well, if you look at Euroscepticism in Britain, uh, and how that was really reflecting these deeper currents, then you can see that from 1996 onwards, really only in three years did we not have at least 50% of the population either saying they wanted to leave the European Union or saying that they wanted to considerably reduce, dramatically reduce the uh, amount of power that the EU had. And when you get to 2012, that, that then jumps up to 60%. So at least 60% of voters for the four years before the referendum were saying that they either wanted to leave outright or they wanted to reduce the amount of power that the European Union had. And so I think you know, collectively we sort of convinced ourselves perhaps into thinking that Remain was the favorite. As I wrote at the time, I, I think the question, the interesting question is not why did leave get 52%, but in many ways, why did leave only get 52%, something that we can come back and discuss. And of course, Aside from the deeper currents that are behind this, we know that one of the, the sort of the shot in the arm for Euroscepticism was this parallel issue of migration and how the emergence of this issue not only fed into that, that background 
for Euroscepticism, but would also propel Nigel Farage and UKIP to the forefront of uh, British politics, in that if you take the long-term view from 1974 all the way through to the immediate pre-referendum period, then as the overall level of net migration begins to climb, which is the gray line, the overall salience of this issue as a percentage of people saying migration or race relations is the most important issue facing Britain also significantly increases. And ordinarily, this would not have been problematic for Britain if we had a political party that was seen to be competent on this issue, that had clear ownership over this issue. And that didn't happen. And I'll show you in a second why that didn't happen. Migration became wrapped up with this issue of Europe. So as Jeff Evans and John Mellon have shown, um, the, the, one of the critical differences between 1975 and 20. Uh, 16, those two referendums, is that the relationship between support for leaving the EU and also wanting to reduce migration becomes much stronger in 2016. The relationship was actually reversed in 1975, that support for leaving was higher among people who were a bit more relaxed about migration. And so it's really, um, it really mattered to what happened because the conservative lead on this issue had just gradually been eroding from 2010 straight through to that referendum period that around the time of the, co the, the election of the coalition government, nearly half of the, po of the uh, population were backing the conservative party on migration. They said this party is the best party to manage migration. And by the time you get through to the referendum, you're really looking at only about 25% of people backing the Conservatives. And today, by the way, that's now down to 19%. So on what quickly became the most important issue for British voters, there was a perceived loss of competency uh, uh, with regard to the main parties. And of course, that really, I would argue, that contributed to two key developments, uh, or two canaries in the coal mine. The first was the rise of the UK Independence Party. So for the first time in post-war Britain, national populism actually becomes uh, an uh, electorally successful uh, project. It's not like the National Front. It's not like the British National Party. It's, it's less toxic. It's, and it, it, crucially, it's, it's building a relationship with these core, uh, core social groups, uh, working class voters, uh, voters with few educational qualifications, um, men, pensioners, white voters, that if you look at how populism grew before the referendum, then it was really growing fastest among these groups, faster than any of the main parties, um, but doing much less well among what you might call the populist periphery groups, professionals, managers, university, degree holders, women, the under 35s, ethnic minorities. But what's interesting is for a while, in relative terms, the UKIP electorate is, is uh, more working class than Labour's, actually, for a short period of time before the referendum. So populism is entrenching itself among these key groups that feel that they've been alienated and marginalized amid what um, Jeff Evans and others have called the liberal consensus that has emerged within British society. And we can see just how strong that relationship became in 2016, because the leave, there's a very strong uh, relationship, an R square of 0.73, between the Leave vote in 2016, the percentage of people that voted for Brexit, and the percentage of people that had been backing UKIP. Not everybody who voted Leave was a supporter of the UK Independence Party. There's an additional bit of space that we can't quite explain through this. But this relationship really embedded national populism within the party system. It gave it an issue, Brexit, alongside that parallel issue of immigration, which national populists didn't really have before. The second canary in the coal mine, which I think is important for the future, was not so much voice through voting for populism, but exit, namely not voting at all. And if you can look at, at uh, work, this is by Oliver Heath, who looks at the differences in overall uh, rates of turnout um, by uh, class between 1964 and uh, 2010, um, Oliver makes the crucial point, I think, that you begin to see, particularly during the Blair years and New Labour, working class voters 
gradually uh, giving up on politics, essentially not, not really voting, um, something that doesn't really happen uh, in other groups. And interestingly, we know now as we get to the 2016 referendum, there were a significant number of voters that did come out to vote leave who hadn't voted at previous uh, general elections. So in a way, this was, I think, another canary in the coal mine as we headed into uh, that Brexit uh, referendum. Now, I actually think that social science has got the leave vote um, mapped pretty well. I think we know a lot about why people voted uh, to leave. Uh, we know that it wasn't a single issue vote. We know from a variety of studies that this was a vote that was driven by uh, an interplay um, of concerns over migration, worries about a loss of Britain's distinctive identity, and also concerns over how the European Union was impacting on Britain's economy and or institutions. We know in a lot of open-ended research, for example, uh, the British election study, Lord Ashcroft, YouGov, um, Noah Carl, that migration um, and wanting to reclaim powers from the European Union, or the idea that decisions about the UK should be taken in the UK, were the two most cited motives in open-ended uh, surveys, uh, survey questions. And we know as well that for some voters, one of the big, I think, myths that emerged after the referendum was that these concerns over migration were strongest in areas that were all white, where people had no experience with migration. Um, we've shown that even after you control for the effect of overall migration, it really was in local authorities that experienced a sudden influx uh, of EU nationals over a short period of time, over about 10 years, uh, that tended to be uh, significantly more supportive of wanting to leave the European Union. We've got a number of other studies that look in particular at this issue. There was crucially a, a sort of liberal leave faction. So this wasn't all about migration. About 20% of the leave electorate is what you would describe as liberal leavers who really weren't that concerned about migration. For them, it was sovereignty, free trade, and so on. Um, but we have uh, some good, good evidence suggesting that leavers, voters, sorry, who felt negatively about how Migration was perceived to be impacting upon the national economy, national culture, and the welfare state were more likely to vote to leave. And also during the campaign period, voters who were aware of uh, rising levels of migration were more likely to switch from remain to leave during the campaign period. Elsa Henderson and colleagues, I think building on Linda Colley's earlier work, have also argued that uh, Englishness and uh, the way in which English national identity has been formed over the years is also, I think, an important backdrop to uh, some of that. Um, the National Center for Social Research, I think, has made also a very useful um, intervention through a report uh, outlining how, in effect, there were sort of three groups that were integral to that Leave electorate. Affluent Eurosceptics, typically voted conservative, older working class voters typically voted uh, Labour, and then a more economically deprived group that were especially concerned about migration and how it was seen to be uh, impacting upon the economy. One thing as well that I would say is that we have in some quarters set up a rather unhelpful debate, is it economics or is it culture? And this applies to the populism literature in general. Um, I think this is a very unhelpful framing. We know, for example, that perceptions of economic loss actually had strong indirect effects on the referendum vote, that people who felt they'd been economically left behind were less likely to see Brexit as a risk. Uh, so you know, I'm very skeptical of uh, accounts that say it's all culture, it's nothing to do with the economy. We've also got a bit of an ongoing debate in political science and uh, economics. Some have suggested that it was in local authority areas that were hit hardest by economic globalization, in particular by imports from China, that were more likely to vote uh, to leave the European Union. Um, other more recent studies have suggested uh, that that is not uh, necessarily uh, the case. And it's also worth noting, by the way, that um, if you compare Remainers and Leavers in terms of their overall knowledge about the European Union, we have a bit of research suggesting that there were not significant differences between 
those two groups. So I think it's fair to say that there is something of an emerging consensus in social science about the Leave vote. I don't think this is something that is going to vex, uh, vex us uh, for the long term. I think we, we, we know that this referendum allowed voters to give expression to a deeper values divide that has been rumbling underneath our party system and society, uh, that social conservatives, a sort of loose alliance of blue collar workers and traditional conservatives who felt alienated by this drift to an economic and socially liberal consensus. We know looking ahead, work by Sarah Holbolt, Thomas Leeper and James Tilley, that since the referendum, our Brexit identities as Remainers or Leavers are becoming just as important as our party political identities as Labour, Conservative or Lib Dem. And they've argued that uh, there is evidence now for what's called effective polarisation, which is becoming as intense as polarisation around partisanship, but we don't yet know if that is a short-term blip or it is a long-term uh, process that's now sinking uh, roots. I think as well it's fair to say that we should be very sceptical about accounts that stress British exceptionalism, that there's something uh, fundamentally unique about Britain when it comes to Brexit. Uh, everything that I've just summarised is entirely consistent with the uh, wider literatures uh, on uh, Euroscepticism in other uh, member states, that it is about a very strong attachment to the nation, a desire to preserve cultural distinctiveness, uh, and also uh, a desire to uh, preserve and uphold uh, uh, what people see and how they feel about their national identity. I think where social science could make a really useful contribution and is already doing so is on this interplay between culture and economics, especially at the local level. I think we do need much more granular local level research on how these uh, motives and concerns are playing out and driving support uh, for populism. Um, and it might be, sorry, I'm just coming back here a second. It might be that this emerging literature in the US of sort of relative deprivation making a comeback now, sort of 50 years on, but this literature looking at how perceptions of loss, so perceptions of economic loss are encouraging voters to feel more culturally threatened, or is it that voters who feel more culturally threatened are more likely to feel economic loss? Uh, and there's a bit of a debate emerging in the Trump literature about which of those uh, comes first. So that's a bit of sort of backdrop uh, to the referendum. And then how is this moment impacting upon our party politics and party system um, today? And if we look at the uh, 2017 general election, as we know that in a way the 2017 general election was an outlier because the gradual decline of this two-party uh, share was uh, interrupted and the two main parties bounced back to 80% of the vote, um, if you get a chance, there's a really good lecture, I think I linked to it, uh, the David Sanders lecture is really, really worth watching from 2017. And David was really on the money. He argued that this was only going to be a sort of short-term blip, that the long-term trend, I think, will, will resume. And I'll explain why in a second. Um, but we did see this reassertion of two-party uh, politics. But we also saw the Conservative and the Labour electorates changing in important ways, and I think quite troubling ways in terms of where British party politics is heading. So if you look at the areas where Labour and the Conservatives um, performed strongly or less so at the 2017 general election, then we really saw the Conservative Party um, enjoy some of its strongest results in areas that had given strong support to leave, in areas where UKIP had crashed and burned, uh, where there were lots of voters with no qualifications, uh, where there were more working class voters, where there were more pensioners. But we saw the Conservative vote really um, fall back uh, in lots of areas that were, uh, sorry, areas that had larger numbers of uh, ethnic minorities, larger numbers of uh, university graduates, middle class professionals, and this crucial group in British politics now, the 30 to 44 year olds, the 30 to 49 year olds. We're having a bit of a debate about the 18 to 24 year olds again, and that's a very valid debate. But if you're trying to understand what's going to happen at the next election, I would argue the 30 to 49 year olds are key. 
Uh, that's the group that swung hardest against the Conservative Party at the last general election in 2017. And that is the things can only get better generation. Uh, voters who grew up under New Labour and Tony uh, Blair, who are instinctively quite socially liberal, who are used to big investment in public services, probably now have young families of their own, probably struggling to pay childcare, probably wondering about how they're going to get their kids to university, thinking about mum and dad's social care costs and what's going to happen to their baby boomer parents. They might be on the housing ladder. They're probably renting, but if they are on the housing ladder, they've just killed themselves getting a 100K deposit. You know, that's the group that I think is absolutely key uh, to what happens uh, at the next election. But we can see, while the Conservatives are becoming more Brexity and more Levy, the Labour Party, uh, in contrast, is doing, as, and remember this is 2017, is doing much better in areas with lots of younger voters, in areas with more university graduates, more ethnic minorities, and of course, Labour, in a way, is riding the sort of ascendancy wave, the newly ascendant uh, social groups uh, in Britain. And that helps to explain largely why Corbyn brought Labour, um, perhaps for various other reasons, not necessarily because of Corbyn, but uh, brought Labour its highest share of the vote since Tony Blair's second landslide in 2001. And you can see that at the aggregate level, at least, if you look at the Conservative vote share, um, as we go from uh, re essentially remain constituencies into very strongly leave constituencies, um, the Conservatives, oh sorry, the Conservatives are doing increasingly well in Brexit land, um, but doing much less well in what you might call Romania. Um, the Labour Party, interestingly, much less of a relationship. And what's, what was interesting about the 2017 election, at least for me, was that the Labour Party vote in pro-Leave seats went up by about six points. Now, it went up by about 13 points in Remain seats, something like that, the most, remain, most strongly Remain seats. And, of course, that is what held <coughs> Theresa May back from converting a lot of those pro-Leave working-class constituencies into Conservative constituencies because um, the Labour vote was more... Uh, resilient than I think May and her strategists had anticipated. And of course, Jeremy Corbyn had also said at that point in time that he was going to respect the referendum, but he was also offering a more radically economically redistributive message to a lot of those voters saying, for the many, not the few, uh, and offering them lots of policies that they uh, instinctively uh, supported. Uh, the Conservative Party really only did very well in seats where UKIP completely collapsed. Um, UKIP needed to lose about 10 percentage points before the Conservatives saw a significant increase in the share of their vote. Why does this matter? Obviously, I think the Conservatives have absorbed that national populist tradition, and it has had a significant effect on their electorate. So if you look at the individual level, this is from the British election study, where the Leave vote went in 2017. More than a half of Nigel Farage's 2015 electorate went Conservative in 2017, compared with only about 18% of the UKIP vote that went to Labour. So this is this big purple chunk that breaks off and goes to the Conservatives. Uh, this has f profoundly altered the composition of the Conservative electorate, as I'll come back to. The Remain vote, um, Labour, which was already the most popular in 2015 among voters who voted Remain, really wins uh, large numbers of these Conservative Remainers, a significant uh, faction that break off uh, for Jeremy Corbyn and Labour. But Corbyn does especially well among three other groups. He picks up a lot of Lib Dems. Um, he's now got a big problem with this group, I'll come back to. Um, he picks up lots of Green Party voters, does very well. In fact, picks up two thirds of the 2015 uh, Greens and one in four of the Lib Dems. Uh, and so around more than half of the 2016 Remain vote drifts off to Labour. But also a lot of undecided Labour leaners who were waiting to make up their minds about Jeremy Corbyn during the campaign went back to Labour in the final few weeks. And that really allowed Corbyn to get up to that 40% of the vote, a coalition of 
uh, Greens, Lib Dems, Conservative Remainers, traditional Labour voters and undecided voters who uh, came home, if you like, in the final weeks. I think this has put the Conservative Party in particular in a real dilemma um, because if you look at how the Conservative electorate has changed, this is very crude, I had to do this quite late, um, but if you look at the British election study uh, data and some other data from NatSEN that's been compiled, John Curtis had put some of this uh, out uh, a little while ago. Uh, what's interesting uh, about the Conservative Party at least is in 20, between 2015 and 2017, the Conservative Party is hemorrhaging support among 18 to 25 year olds, 26 to 35 year olds. It's not doing anywhere near as well among well, uh, university degree holders, but it's really doubling down on non-degree holders and doing a little bit better than we might expect among uh, working class voters. All of whom I think inject a new calculation into the conservative electorate, one that David Cameron uh, didn't really need to worry about. And I'll show you that in a second. Labor, I mean, these numbers among you know, Labour's growth among 18 to 45 year olds is pretty, pretty impressive. Um, Labour's growth among degree holders uh, also and among more professional uh, middle class voters, uh, you know, Labour did, did pretty well. Um, but for the Conservative Party, if you break this down and look at values and attitudes, it means the Conservative Party is now far more dependent upon leavers, uh, has become more uh, socially conservative as an electorate um, and also if you ask conservative voters look what do you want to prioritize during the um, Brexit negotiations between 2015 and 2017 the conservatives because they've hoovered up all of those UKIP voters now they're really dependent upon voters that want them to prioritize immigration control over retaining access to the single market. So the electorate on the conservative side, I don't think I'm telling you much that your instincts don't already probably lead you towards. The conservative electorate is in, in quite a few ways significantly different from David Cameron's electorate. And that of course explains why uh, we've seen the sort of internal trauma within the Conservative Party uh, that we've seen in recent, uh, in recent uh, weeks. Now, of course, this also shows that the electorates for the two main parties in 2017 were also um, very fragile, that we've got all of this volatility going on, we've got all of this churn, we've got this fragmentation, and it's clear that in 2017, none of this really was going to hold that you had these cross-cutting issues that were playing out, that it was not, we weren't looking at particularly stable tribal electorates. We were looking at sort of somewhat unusual uh, alliances that have been put together in that particular moment in time. And as we now know, what happened a few weeks ago is, yes, these are European <laughs> Parliament elections. We should treat them with a pinch of salt. This isn't a usual first past the post contest, it, it's characterized by more expressive voting, more protest voting, and all of those kinds of things. But what we really saw was the return of that fragmentation and the continued meltdown of the two-party system. The Brexit party uh, wins comfortably. Nigel Farage becomes the first party leader in British history to win two elections with two different parties. Um, <laughs> The Lib Dems have a great election. Lib Dems are back. I mean, you know, really good result for the Lib Dems. That allows them to cannibalize uh, disgruntled Remainers. Um, Labour uh, falls to uh, uh, one of its lowest share of the vote, really, since it emerged as the main party of opposition. The Greens do reasonably well. Conservatives, worst result ever. Um, SNP do okay. Uh, UKIP, of course, completely collapse. But this is what I find remarkable. The polling, this is uh, Harold Clark sent me this. Um, the, the story going into that election is, is essentially this, which is the two-party system in Westminster polls, um, just, just entering into a sort of complete breakdown period. Um, this point is not only when the Brexit party emerges, but actually when Britain fails to leave 
the European Union at the end of March 2019. And then we see the rise of the outsiders, both the Lib Dems, the Brexit Party, to a lesser extent the Greens, really underscoring how we are in this multi-party uh, arena, yet also with a two-party uh, system. Now, what's interesting about the 2019 European Parliament elections is that they've really underlined how uh, a lot of the churn and change that I've talked about has reached kind of new levels. And there are a few things that I think are quite interesting. We don't have much individual level data yet that I've had time to get into, but we do have some things that have come out uh, that I think are worth considering. The first is Leave had a turnout problem a few weeks ago. Uh, in the sense that people who were living in places which had given strong support to leaving the EU in 2016 were less likely to vote at the 2019 European Parliament elections. Uh, that in the really strong Leave constituencies, uh, turnout was, um, was low. Now, whether that's because of disillusionment with the Brexit process, uh, whether it's because it's the European Parliament election, don't know, but areas that were more strongly remain did uh, record much higher levels of turnout. The second thing that's interesting is the relationship between national populists and leavers has strengthened. That uh, the relationship between the Brexit Party's uh, vote and the, Le the 2016 Leave vote um, is stronger than the relationship was between UKIP uh, and the Leave vote. Um, but it's not widened. So Farage has basically um, strengthened his relationship with the most leave uh, areas, but he's not really branched out into many, many other uh, areas, um, which is obviously a problem for them. Um, meanwhile, if you uh, look at the uh, Lib Dem, the relationship between support for the Lib Dems, who did very well, and the leave vote, there's a less uh, clear relationship than there is for the national populace, which suggests that the resurgence of the Lib Dems is not just a Remain backlash, that the Lib Dems are picking up a lot of voters who might say none of the above, or they might be concerned about local issues, um, but they're hoovering up uh, a lot of voters who uh, might not just be viewing uh, the Lib Dems as a kind of rep uh, a political home to express their uh, uh, sort of remain uh, views. For the Conservative Party, of course, they're entering into a sort of nightmare uh, territory. Um, on the one hand, what's interesting is that there's not much of a relationship between support for the Brexit Party and how the Conservative Party did at the European Parliament elections. And one reason for that is because the people who would have defected from the Conservatives had already gone in 2014. So they'd already gone to UKIP in 2014, and in 2019, they then just stayed with the Brexit Party and effectively used national populism as a kind of stick to hit the Conservatives and register their disapproval. Um, so this is a problem for the Conservatives, and what they're going to do with these Eurosceptic Conservatives, I think they suspect they'll gun after them, but but it didn't directly hit their vote share a few weeks ago. The Lib Dems did. Uh, the better the Lib Dems did, uh, effectively, the, the worse uh, the Conservatives did. Um, and you know, this is one part of the debate that I don't think has fully um, uh, you know, got into our public discussion about what's happening. But the Conservatives now are having to battle on two fronts. And it really was in more leafy, uh, affluent, uh, typically remain areas, Richmond on Thames, Kingston on Thames, Winchester, St Albans, uh, those kinds of areas, the Conservative vote utterly collapsed, uh, often uh, uh, in a way that helped the Liberal uh, Democrats. So sequencing, I think, is key to understanding where the Conservatives go. They've sort of already kind of alienated uh, their more pro-leave, uh, more sort of blue collar, less well-educated wing that's kind of now hovering around the Brexit party, waiting to see what Boris or, or, or whoever wins the leadership election does. But they've now opened up this second flank by talking so much about how to win back the levers. They've now opened up this second flank and are getting hit by the Lib Dems, uh, which I think is, is uh, going to be a real problem for them. 
Um, now, Labour have a somewhat more complex uh, uh, dilemma. Uh, Labour was hurt by the Brexit Party, especially in areas with lots of voters with few qualifications. So in Left Behind Labour Heartlands, a few weeks ago, the Brexit Party did hurt the Labour vote. And there's some more analysis in this paper that gets into that. Um, the Lib Dem um, uh, vote share, uh, there's little evidence to suggest that the Lib Dems gain significantly at the expense of Labour. But remember that what we're doing here is comparing 2014 with um, 2019. So I think what has probably happened, and we'll find out in a few weeks, is that the Lib Dems have picked off a large chunk of Labour's 2017 electorate, which won't necessarily show up by comparing the European elections. So the Labour, what was a very fragile Labour electorate in 2017, is now also rapidly imploding. There are no easy answers for Labour. If Labour drift to remain, uh, the price of that strategy will be setting up the Brexit Party as a permanent um, challenger in left-behind Labour communities, is my view. Um, some of my colleagues disagree. Um, the alternative, if Labour hold on to this kind of ambiguous position um, and perhaps allow the Conservatives to uh, uh, take ownership of Brexit in the autumn, they might be able to hold on to these two wings in the short term, but long term there are irreconcilable value differences and attitudes within this Labour electorate on issues like migration, on issues like Europe, on issues uh, like um, oh, sorry, uh, identity. So both parties are really now faced with this pincer movement that's going to shape our politics as, as we head into the next general election, as we head through a very uh, bumpy uh, summer and autumn. You know, you've now got a situation for the Conservatives where more than half of their 2017 electorate just voted for the national populace. Just 21% of their 2017 electorate uh, stayed with them. Uh, Labour uh, voters from 2017 were more likely to stay with Labour, but only 38% uh, actually uh, did so. Uh, to put this in perspective, even if at the next election the Brexit Party were to get 15% of the vote, which is basically what UKIP got in 2015, um, and, and you know, is, is, I think, a plausible scenario, that's probably going to cost the Conservatives in the region of 40 to 55 seats. A lot of those marginal seats where the Conservatives are just hanging on, I think would end up going to Labour or the Lib Dems. So whoever takes over the Conservative Party not only has to fend off the Lib Dems in Romania, but is also going to have to get that Brexit Party vote down to three, four, five points. Linton Crosby, of course, in 2015 managed that tension by offsetting losses to Labour or UKIP or uh, by capturing Lib Dem seats in the South West. What the Lib Dems now have is really intriguing, is an opportunity to get revenge for that decapitation strategy and take a lot of seats back from the Conservatives at the next general election, which I think would be uh, really interesting. And just sort of as we head into the sort of conclusions, the other thing to say is if you look at Westminster polls and what's happening as we go through this leadership election, um, I do think um, the, uh, the extent to which 2017 Conservatives, which are now shifting over to the Brexit Party, I think this will end up being quite short term if Boris ends up taking over, but they've now, last week, reached the crossover point in Westminster polls. So more 2017 Conservatives are now saying they'll vote, they plan to vote for the Brexit Party than will vote for the Conservatives <laughs> at the next general election. So this is a real problem, uh, obviously, uh, for the Conservatives. So putting it all together, I mean, what, where are we now, where are we headed? So I would argue that the fundamentals in Britain's party system in our society are changing in a way that is going to favour um, outsiders. It's probably going to favour um, uh, national populists, um, at least in terms of establishing a fairly permanent presence. We've got a long-term weakening of partisan identification, a decline of class voting. We know we've got these very you know, high levels of volatility and vote switching, which is going to make it harder to predict election outcomes. It's going to mean it's going to be easier to start new parties, to 
to lead an insurrection from one election to the next. And it's going to be harder for the main parties because those old tribal loyalties uh, and habitual voting is just not going to be there like it was in earlier years. I think we do have an issue around continuing uh, uh, working class exclusion, that we have an issue. I mean, Thomas Piketty has recently written a paper on this with regards to European party systems that as centre-left parties are increasingly dominated by middle-class graduates and as centre-right parties are increasingly dominated by what he'd call the, the merchant class, which has very little interest in economic redistribution, there is a, a real issue with regards to representation uh, and policy responsiveness to working class communities, which we've seen through our Brexit debate. We could have had a very different debate over those communities, and we just haven't had it. Um, there's a very good book, The New Politics of Class, uh, Evans and Tilly, who argue that um, we are likely to see a spiral of working class exclusion from our broader electoral politics. I think that is also reasonably likely if we end up seeing the Conservative Party focus only on uh, those Lib Dem areas and, and not the Mansfields and the Stoke-on-Trent South. And it's also likely, I think, if we don't get a, a government that is much more serious about economic redistribution uh, and reform. The Conservative Party have this n nightmare catch-22, as I've mentioned, that if they drift back to One Nation Tories uh, sort of who are flirting with the Lib Dems via a closer deal with the European Union, a softer Brexit. This might fend off the revolt in Romania, um, but such a uh, uh, but it's going to leave their their more national populist flank wide open, um, and it's going to be impossible for them uh, to hold on to power without uh, a large chunk of that flank. But if they push alternatively for this hard Brexit WTO outcome, which now looks increasingly uh, likely, then the Lib Dems are back in the game and will likely start taking a lot of uh, sort of more soft Brexit conservative. Uh, seats. And for Labour too, there is really no uh, easy way out. Their 2017 electorate is quickly falling apart. Um, that if they drift to a second referendum, is the price establishing uh, the Brexit party as a, a number two? Remember, UKIP were already second in about uh, 40 constituencies in 2015. It's not clear what happens to those constituencies if Labour do move next week, as many uh, uh, or, or as they are rumoured to do. Um, and very lastly, I think given what we're seeing in the attitudes and the transformation of the party system, you know, we do have a situation now where for the first time in a long time, um, challengers and outsiders are, I think, increasingly getting around the credibility gap that they are seen as being legitimate, credible alternative vehicles. Uh, whether that will play out at a general election is unclear. We already saw uh, the Lib Dems do very well in 2010. We saw UKIP do well in 2015. We're seeing the Greens doing, doing well uh, increasingly. And it may be that we are uh, going through something of a psychological readjustment with our voters, that perhaps the role of that credibility gap uh, may be less uh, potent uh, than it was in earlier years. Um, so all things considered, um, we're not going to see the return of mainstream party politics, sort of a stable two-party system with coherent or relatively coherent electorates and clear preferences uh, anytime soon. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. That's, that's social science in real time. As they say, and uh, even as we speak, I think they're uh, whittling down the Conservative leadership down to the, the final two. Um, we've got about 10 or so minutes um, for questions. I'm assuming everybody's got a question. <laughs> so why don't we take them in groups of two or three, if that's possible. Can you take two here, Corinne? Um, yes, uh, next. Just a quickie. I think I'm right in saying that when Thatcher was elected, Um, if if, we, if um, Britain does leave the EU, uh, do you think that the, the Brexit Party uh, vote 
will just very quickly shrink and be reabsorbed into one of the other parties, or could Farage reconstitute the Brexit party as a populist party of Boston? Can you remember these, Matthew? Because you yeah. need, you need yeah. to repeat them for the camera, yeah. the question sure. and the answer. You, this is a lot of work here. Correct yeah. one, yeah. Uh, thank you very much indeed. A rather striking analysis um, and, and, and hits lots of points of those who are political activists like I am. One of my questions is, have the politicians listened to you? And secondly, do you think your analysis suggests that Corbyn's got it right? Okay, and Raphael over there. <laughs> Change floods significant parts of the country. <laughs> so there's a bit of variety in there, Matthew, for you there. <laughs> nice and easy. Um, okay, uh, so on the question about you know, if, if Brexit's delivered, what happens to the Brexit party? I think, well, we saw in the 2017 general election the complete collapse of the UK Independence Party when those voters concluded that. They thought Theresa May and the Conservative Party were going to deliver on their, their uh, Brexit preference. So it's, it's, given the volatility that we've got and the fluidity within the electorate, I think it's likely that if we end up leaving the EU and we have a summer or an autumn of Boris saying, you know, we're now going to leave, and I'm not entirely sure how he's going to do that, but we have uh, Boris saying, you know, we're going to leave and we're going to get out and eventually we do end up leaving, then I think the Conservative Party will probably be able to take the lion's share of that vote back. But of course that injects a problem too into the electorate, which is the better and better they're doing among those voters and playing that message and, and singing that song, uh, the worse they're doing in their uh, more leafy, affluent, uh, one nation, uh, more remain uh, seats. So th there are massive trade-offs. Rory Stewart, for example, is a good example. I mean, if the Conservative Party were clever, they would have somebody like that on the front line for the next five years because they need to now um, talk as a, broad, uh, as a broad tent, not as a, as a Brexit party because that's clearly having a significant uh, effect. Um, so I think it is likely they'll go back. Now, Lord Ashcroft's figures, by the way, suggest that I think really high figures are going to stay with the Brexit party. Now, if you go back and you look at some of that data at the time of the 2015 election to 2017, it was a similar story. About half of the UKIP vote said they'd stay loyal with UKIP in 2017, and of course they didn't. Only less than 2% of the vote went to Farage. So I think it's reasonable to accept, expect that vote to go back. Um, the question on uh, what, what should the parties effectively do and are they listening, um, I don't know. I think, has Corbyn got it right? Um, I think, so for the Labour Party, it, it ultimately comes down to, I think, you know, in a way, your own politics and how you view things. So if you are being a pragmatist, you might say, in order to stem losses from its 2017 electorate, Labour should shift to a more strongly remain position. Because even in pro-leave Labour seats, their majorities are often so commanding that they can probably just about get through this Brexit dilemma without losing too many of those. OK. Um, on the other hand, uh, however, the, as we saw the European Parliament elections, we're seeing things that we really haven't seen before. So take Wales as an example. Uh, Labour were completely obliterated in Wales, uh, not only by the uh, Brexit party, but by the Welsh nationalists. And as we've seen in Scotland, it, it, these party systems can be completely transformed in a short space of time. And we know that the Labour Party is vulnerable in the sort of more traditional blue collar left behind seats that have been given giving pretty strong support to uh, to to populists. Um, so there's no easy way out. I mean, Corbyn managed 2017 by being very ambiguous and that brought over the Lib Dems and the Greens and some conservative remainers. I think those groups have now run out of patience. I think they've just said, you know, I'm, I'd like a decision either way, but would be my instinct. And that's why we've seen them then flood back to these other parties, the Lib Dems, the Greens, Change UK, um, and, and then going into the general election, Labour's real strategic question is how does it bring them back? How can it hold? I think there's an even bigger question for social democracy, which was revealed in 1985 in Capitalism and Social Democracy, uh, which is a great book, which is exactly what we're seeing. You've got a centre-left party that is 
really um, stretched between Hampstead and Hartlepool and over the longer term has to really think seriously about how to um, revive and sustain a coalition of voters that think fundamentally differently about a lot of issues. Once you get past economic redistribution, they do hold very different preferences. Um, and that's a question not just for Labour, it's a question for every social democratic party. And as we're seeing in Germany, um, where the Greens are uh, surging, um, this could yet have a lot of unpredictable effects in Britain too. On climate change, I mean, I think my, I'm not someone who works remotely in that area, but anything that underlines <laughs> competition over uh, resources and anything that is, uh, you know, is seen to exacerbate the value divides that we are now seeing between, very crudely put, social liberals that view it as a pressing priority, mm -hmm. social conservatives who are much less persuaded by that as an issue and would argue the money should go elsewhere, so on. Um, these new lifestyle issues, I mean, this is Inglehart coming back to life, effectively, from the silent revolution of the 1970s, that we're now seeing this play out in a major way within our own party system. So any of those big lifestyle issues, climate change, but also um, um, uh, sort of, uh, same-sex couples, uh, rights for um, LGBT communities, also migration, all of these issues that are touching on this values divide, of course, are the ones that are now pulling the party system in different directions. I don't think there's an easy answer to, to that. Okay, it's your tea break, but I'm going to take three more um, questions of Paul here, and then this gentleman here, and then over there. So a, a question about um, the Labour Party, really. You've sort of, I mean, you, you've talked about the values divide and Hampstead and Hartley Paul and, and so on, but almost as if it's the Labour Party as it ever was. And um, I just wondered if you have reflections on the extent to which it is now itself a populist party of the left and the extent to which um, that, that may change over time. Because one always feels that the sort of Corbynism is coming in under the radar because we're so focused on Brexit, but actually there's an awful lot more to it than, than that. Okay, that's quite a big one. Um. <laughs> Wouldn't I, if I was sitting in the Conservative Central Office or Labour headquarters, Say, well, all very well, but we're going to, the first past the post is going to save us as it always has in the past. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you've used the word uh, populism throughout, and I'm trying to struggle with what it means. Does it really mean that these are people for whom their decisions are, are, are totally emotional and value driven rather than relating to any sort of deep analysis? Of what's going on, because certainly when you look at the way that the background works in terms of lack of education and, and so on of the people who uh, who want to leave, um, rather than the detailed analysis of what the implications of that is going to be, mm. are you really saying that the populist <coughs> vote is driven by just a, an emotional drive? Okay. Oh, so if I keep them brief to so let everyone get a coffee. Yeah. Uh, um, so on uh, Labour, um, I think you're absolutely right to ask that question. So my, my, my hunch on what's happening um, behind the Brexit debate is that a lot of the fundamentals are actually flowing in Labour's direction. So if you look at measures on economic pessimism, attitudes around nationalisation, redistribution, that populist sentiment of, you know, the banks are... Uh, uh, taking us for a ride, the system is rigged, um, with, there's one law for the rich, another for the poor. If you put all of those questions to people, you're looking at 70-80% saying, yeah, actually I think you know, Corbyn's got a point on some of these issues. Now, that's arguably you could say that's always been the case, but now we have a Labour Party that I think is more um, concertedly campaigning on those. So in a way, the sort of Labour strategy, I suppose, may be just kind of you know, just try and hold this thing together to get through this, the next six months and Brexit, and then try and push for this reassertion of that more traditional left-right divide by trying to talk up the redistribution points, by talking, I mean, if you look, for example, at what voters want to do on tax and spend, where the Conservatives are going, I would argue, is completely at odds with where most people are, which is most people now, I think for the first time since 2002, about 60% are saying, I'd like taxes to go up to spend more on public services, please, because I can now see us 
I can see councils closing down and you know, all, the, all the other stuff that you know about. Um, so I think you know, Corbyn is divisive, but Corbynomics is a little bit more popular than we often think. And that, I suspect, will come back and hit the Conservatives in a way that they're not quite ready for because they're talking about tax cuts, they're talking about helping folks on 50 to 80K, you know, all of these things that I think are you know, putting them at odds with where the public mood at large is. So let's see on that. The first pass of post system, I mean, the, it's when are we going to get to the tipping point? I think that's the interesting thing. I suspect you're right. I suspect that we will see the two main parties. I suspect Labour will hold off the Lib Dems. I suspect the Conservatives will manage to hold off uh, the Brexit party. But overall, of course, we're seeing the party system increasingly constrained. The SNP in Scotland, um, it's harder and harder now for either Labour or the Conservatives to get those big majorities that they need in order to command a very clear mandate. So I, I think first past the post may come to their rescue, but we are, as I've shown with the long-term trends, increasingly in a political world where multi-party politics is, is, is swirling away underneath the, the surface and electoral reform you know, it may be something we need to come back and think about, but of course we know that takes political leadership and that might not be uh, too, too quick on the horizon given Labour's, Labour's attempts and the Lib Dems' attempts. Um, but, you know, I'd be interested for people who uh, uh, went on the ride with the SDP in the 1980s and so on, I'd be interested in hearing their views over tea and coffee about whether we are at this tipping point. Um, and there was a final question. Uh, the question about populism. No, I think, I think there is a distinct set of ideas, actually. I don't think it is just emotional politics. So we define national populism as a movement that prioritises the interests and culture of the nation against elites that they argue are self-serving, corrupt, um, uh, and neglectful of the common man or woman, whoever that is, and it's never really defined by populist. Um, but I do think that we, we do have a tendency to interpret populism merely as protest politics, as something that is driven by irrational, emotional reactions to issues, whereas I think the literature on populism now, which is, you know, Everybody wants to do a PhD on populism, right? It's, it's, a gl it's great when you find a PhD student that doesn't want to work on populism, to be honest. Um, but, but that literature is pretty clear, that, that populists have a very clear anchor in specific social groups, that their electorate is, is pretty well defined, uh, and that they are offering a reasonably uh, clear set of positions uh, with regard to upholding social conservatism, stability, group conformity, um, anti-internationalism, anti-cosmopolitanism, you know, however you want to frame that. Um, and that's what's given, given them this durability from the 1980s onwards, that in effect this is a party family that's been coming for about, about 30 years. Um, and I don't think it's going to go any, anywhere anytime soon. Matthew, you've, you've, like all the best lectures, you've left us wanting a whole lot, a whole lot more. You actually made quite a fair number of predictions. You didn't actually promise to do anything, and any of them didn't actually uh, come to pass, but uh, we'll forgive you that. Uh, we all now go downstairs, I think, down to the cafe for tea. I don't know how we're going to do it. We have to go down for tea and get back here for four o'clock. Uh, so good luck with that. But can we thank Matthew for an absolutely fabulous... <laughs>